My name is Kenneth Gravois, and I'm the sugarcane specialist with the LSU Ag Center. And I'm going to provide you with a uh, update on the uh, 2020 crop. Like Jim said, the crop that's still out there. <clears throat> but you always like a good quote. Some of y'all may have seen this on social media. Sustainability is big out there, and uh, you know the consumers want to know. <clears throat> excuse me, where their where their food is coming from. And I like the quote from uh, uh, Tim McIntyre. He's a vice president for communications at Domino. He says, we'll never tell a farmer how to farm or a rancher how to ranch. You know, we believe they're the experts. So, uh, you know, a big reason that uh, they're the expert is, you know, the research based behind farming and the way that they run their operation. So good for Domino. <clears throat> well, when you talk about a cane crop, it's always good to uh, start. I like to start with uh, rainfall. Uh, the locations are the airports at New Orleans, Baton Rouge, and Lafayette. And in Generette, that's at the uh, Iberia Research Station. So you see the 30-year average on the right. And last year's rainfall was just slightly above um the 30 year average and that seems to be the trend if you look at this is um a graph by dr steve uh, caparata at, at channel nine but you, know, you go back to 2012 and uh you can see that you know we've been above average rainfall for uh quite a span haven't had one of those really dry years like uh, 2011 and of course we remember the big flooding rains in August of 2016, which kind of set record rainfall at 90 and a half inches. So Jim talked about expanding acreage and uh, that that trend continues. You can see uh, at the bottom of the graph that's uh, acreage uh, by year from 2015 to 2020. You know, 410,000 acres in 2015, and last year uh, just north of 496,000 acres. Uh, this table has uh, acreage comparing 2019 and 2020 acreage, and in the far right column, I uh, did the uh, percent increase. Uh, you know, we're losing acreage along the river, St. James, St. Charles. St. John losing acreage in Terrebonne and uh, you know lower lower Lafouche Parish, uh, but our industry is moving north and west, and so the parishes like uh, Avoyles, Rapide, St. Landry, Evangeline, you know, Point Capie, Vermilion out west, uh, those those parishes are uh, picking up a lot of a lot of cane acreage, so uh, we need to be. Uh, responsive to that as we, uh, you know, think about where we conduct our research. And I think this is the northernmost field. This is just on the other side of uh, LSU A. If you've ever been on their campus, it's, you know, in the south part of, of Alexandria, but this is a field just past the water tower uh, uh, as you're going up. Uh, 71 into Alexandria, field of uh, John Van Mall. I want to talk a little bit about 299 and really the year started off uh, cool and wet coming out of uh, winter dormancy is always uh, interesting and it's even more interesting when you got a majority of your acreage in 299 and four or five years ago I, I showed this uh, picture. This is a variety trial. Uh, in the Rio Grande Valley of uh, South Texas. Uh, they conduct variety uh, tests with Louisiana and Florida varieties. And in the foreground, that's 299. And behind that green variety is another plot of 299. So whenever you see this light yellow, light green, that's really from uh, high pH soils. These soils are in the low eights. And so a lot of times you can tie up iron. That's uh, more than likely iron chlorosis from uh, tying up iron. But I mean, the main point is that, you know, 299 is a racehorse and it kind of has a 
a narrow range by which it likes to run. And uh, obviously any kind of stress really shows up in 299. This is a picture from uh, Triangle Farms uh, on the Tesh, what they call gray land. These lands tend to be uh, higher in pH than uh, what we typically see out and about. And I don't know if the picture really shows it well, but that's two rows of 299 planted in between 804 and uh, 804 unfazed by the uh, higher pH and the 299 uh, was really struggling. Again, I don't know if the picture paints it, but we went out there, uh, uh, Jeff and Blaine Vietar and I, when we were out and about uh, looking at some of these situations. And then, of course, it always seems to manifest itself worse in uh, seed cane. The picture on the left. To the left side of that is a 299 cut for seed and what you see on the right is cane cut during normal harvest real night and day difference picture on the right is from alma seed cane in the foreground and right behind it cane cut for the mill uh, obviously seed cane being a big part of the problem and then you put a stress on it uh, you know, 299 being susceptible to brown stripe, you see a lot of brown stripe moving in and it really doesn't go away till things start warming up and fertilizer goes out and you start growing out of these stress situations. So, you know, we've talked about this in articles with the bulletin and just other, other presentations. You know, it's just a stress on a racehorse, got cool, wet conditions coming out of winter dormancy that will manifest some with root rot disease. You got to put herbicide out in the spring. So there's always the stress from a herbicide application. We talked about pH and nutrient stress. We may not have pHs in the low to mid eights like South Texas, but we do have pHs in the mid sevens. And uh, we do know that that's, that's part of the stressor on 299. You know, the other thing, Herman and I have talked about this, uh, you know, 299, you know, it'll give you some Maalox moments after you plant it, wait for it to come up. And uh, with that, you know, we, we're covering it very lightly. And, and with that, you don't have a very, uh, very much of a crown uh, after that cane germinates. So, you know, you dig up some of these plants that are dead and you might have one or two eyes. And if those eyes germinated, there's not a big reservoir of eyes behind it to uh, really come in and fill in. So, you know, and you're going to cover your whole crop like you cover your major variety. That's a quote from Herman, and that's that's true because we didn't just see this in 299 last year, but certainly it manifested, you know, worse in 299. Again, seed cane is a uh, is affected uh, more. So really, we had a, a, a really dry spring. And like I've always said, a dry spring never uh, killed a cane crop. Uh, you know, that's the drought monitor taken on April 28th. And uh, I, I, I like a good dry spring. And it's a quote from Dr. Paul Miller. He's, he's a meteorologist that I've gotten to know. He's with the School of the Coast. And uh, you know, he, he posts a lot of interesting things on social media, but we had a we had an excellent spring. You know, you can work and fertilize the crop like you wanted, not like you had to. And, uh, you know, it's always good to kind of get the crop off in that manner. I know Rich and Dr. Brenda Tubanya have talked about sulfur deficiencies and, uh, you know, a lot of low sulfur diesel, Clean Air Act, cleaning up emissions. Uh, so we've talked about seeing more and more sulfur deficiencies. And I wanted to talk about uh, something that uh, got called out on a couple of these situations in the spring. The year before, it was two different situations, but similar. And uh, this is uh, in St. Martin Parish. And you can see at the bottom of the picture, you know, the growth is uh, not nearly as green. Uh, and lush. Uh, it was really struggling. It looked like it hadn't really picked up its nitrogen and it was only fertilized with nitrogen. So 
I went out there and spread out some 13, 13, 13, and uh, John Bear with Lasuka came back and put out some sulfur behind it. And you can see in the top part of that picture, you know, some of those greened up areas. We just wanted to see, you know, if it was sulfur versus nitrogen versus both, and turned out it was both. And, um, you know, uh, the grower went ahead and uh, John lined him up with uh, you know, some a UAN solution that was about 27 more units of nitrogen and about the same amount of sulfur. And they left three rolls out and you can see that they were able to green that crop up pretty well. The common denominator in all this um, was there was a trash blanket uh, at both of the locations that I visited, one on the river, one on the tash. And uh, both had only fertilized with nitrogen. So. When we finally did get the spring rains, um, I think we had a flare up in uh, microbial pro uh, populations degrading the trash blanket, causing a, a nitrogen. We did some tissue testing and, you know, we showed very low levels of both nitrogen and sulfur. And the fix was easy, you know, 100 pounds of ammonium sulfate would have done the same thing. So uh, something that we need to be aware of. Again, a great summer. Uh, not too dry, uh, not super wet. We managed to avoid, you know, those six, seven inch rainfall events. There were some dry areas. I know St. Landry Parish was dry uh, in for parts of the summer, but by and large, a really good summer that took us into an early start to the planting season. You know, we started planting in late July. Some people were delayed a bit waiting on H2A labor, but by and large, the planting ratios were good. The cane was straight. And a lot of people finished early. Um, you know, by the time Hurricane Laura hit at the end of August, uh, we figured 85% of our acreage was already planted. So uh, that was good news on the planting front. And good news on the planting front means good news for the 2021 crop. But there, there were some situations out there. This is a, a replant situation based on uh, storm surge. This is uh, um, just past uh, Glencoe, uh, Troy Freeu. Uh, I didn't know there was a Vashery uh, on the test. I grew up in Vashery, Louisiana on, in St. James Parish. So I know there are several different Vasheries out there, but this is some really good land that was underwater for quite a while. Uh, he had crop insurance and uh, went out with the adjuster and uh, Troy and, you know, we had to kind of write a letter stating that it was a total loss. And he replanted and uh, he was wondering how do you replant a field with all that old seed cane behind it. And, you know, I had done something one time, just hip that row up high and open it just above the old seed cane. He planted billets. He didn't take slats or blades out. He just sped up the feed rollers and planted a little bit longer billet because they're in the middle of grinding. And by December the 7th, you can see that the cane was emerging very well. So, you know, the replants uh, seem to work real well, especially with billets. There, there was some late planting. Chris Gravois was is getting some land prepared and, you know, he's covering up canals, knocking down trees. He was, you know, with the dry fall that we had, he was able to get a couple blocks uh, uh, in shape. <clears throat> and this is early November, again, planting billets. And for heavy land, that land worked up real well. And uh, he was able to get uh, more planting done than he really anticipated. <clears throat> there was some succession planting. Again, you know, we had dry September, October, early part of November, and uh, this is a field uh, with Gary Gravois planted in mid to late October. Uh, again, billet planted on his day off, didn't really change his machine up except to speed up the feed rollers to cut a little bit longer billet, and uh, it's just, you, you, you can't tell that this is even uh, precision, I mean, succession planted, so. Uh, Really good year, really good job for planting. I know George LaCour um, succession planted some cane. So uh, again, all that bodes well for 2021. 